With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favorite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favorite. These are a few of my favorite things. Whether you shop delivery, pickup, or in-store, Kroger brand has all your favorite things. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Hello, thanks for joining me again on Astronomy Daily. Andrew Dunkley here, your host. Hope you had a great weekend. Coming up on today's program to kick off the week, more on the Hippocras star chart. We've talked about this before and it's um, fascinating. We've got more information on that. A SpaceX moon mission is a distinct possibility. Where stars go to die and something really amazing at Epcot, which was unfortunately not there when I last went but I might have to go back again. That's all coming up on this edition of Astronomy Daily. Astronomy Daily, the podcast, with your host, Andrew Dunkley. And we welcome back Hallie, our AI reporter, after she spent the weekend in virtual reality checking out the Taj Mahal. Hi, Hallie. How are you? Hi, Andrew. I'd ask how you went at golf on the weekend, but your club publishes the results on their website, so I know you came third in a grade. Well done. Oh, thanks, Hallie. That's really nice. What I can't find out is if you choked. Ha! Oh, that'll be enough of that. Although, yeah, I probably did a little bit. Let's get the news, Hallie. SpaceX just got permission to begin building out the next generation of its Starlink Internet mega constellation. On Thursday, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission approved SpaceX to deploy 7,500 Starlink. 2.0 satellites in low Earth orbit. The ruling is just a partial victory for SpaceX, however, the company had applied for permission to deploy 29,988 Starlink 2.0 satellites around Earth. The FCC is deferring a decision about the rest of the rollout. The FCC granted just the limited approval to address concerns about orbital debris and space safety, agency officials wrote in the decision document. These and other issues were raised by interested parties regarding the Starlink 2.0 application, which SpaceX filed in 2020. Those aren't the only concerns people have raised about Starlink. Astronomers fret about the mega constellation's impact on their work, for example, and some dark sky advocates worry that it's fundamentally changing the view of the night sky. After 122 million miles in space, the shuttle Endeavour is about to embark on a new mission. This time, its journey will be measured in feet. The retired shuttle's final frontier will be a new building, the Samuel Oskin Air and Space Center, next door to the California Science Center, where it's displayed horizontally. The spaceship will be displayed upright, in launch position, with its enormous orange fuel tank appearing to be attached to its belly and two white booster rockets on either side and a launch gantry, to view the shuttle at every viewpoint. Endeavour, the fifth and final space shuttle to be built, has been in Los Angeles for a decade, positioned as if it were flying in space or soaring through the atmosphere on its way to touchdown. Since going on display in 2012, it has attracted visitors from around the world, skyrocketing attendance at the California Science Center from 1.2 million to 2.4 million. Endeavour started its first orbital mission, the first of 25, in 1992. One of Europe's freshest rocket lines has a big Earth contract lined up. Ariane Space's Vega C rocket, which has a single launch under its belt from earlier this year, will be tasked to launch five Earth observation missions on behalf of the European Union, the company announced last week. The launches are in support of the massive Copernicus set of European satellites that peer at instances of climate change, land use, extreme weather and other crucial aspects of Earth observation. The 115-foot-tall, 35 meters, Vega C launched seven satellites to space during its debut flight in July. Developed by the European Space Agency, the rocket can send 2.3 tons to polar orbit, compared to 1.5 tons for an earlier Vega version. The launches are slated to fly between 2024 and 2026 from Europe's spaceport in Kourou, French Guiana. 
and in just a couple of days the moon will turn full as Mars arrives at opposition to the sun, resulting in an almost perfect alignment of the sun, earth, moon and Mars. It's likely to be that way in the evening hours of Wednesday December 7 when the full moon will appear in very close proximity to the now brilliant planet Mars. In fact, the moon will turn full at 11.08 p.m. Eastern Standard Time 4.08 GMT on December 8 followed by Mars, arriving at opposition to the sun just 87 minutes later. This will result in an almost perfect alignment in space of the sun, earth, moon and Mars. Should be quite a sight to see Andrew. Yes, indeed, Hallie, and I might have to dust off the telescope and see if I can get a nice photo of that and publish it on the Space Nuts podcast group Facebook page, perhaps. All right, we'll um, catch up with you a little later. And now to a story we have discussed before, but it keeps making the news and is worth talking about again, the Hippocus Star Catalogue. Uh, It was written over 2,000 years ago and is the oldest known attempt to position the stars in our sky on on paper, or in this case, parchment. Now, fragments of this star catalogue, which were written by a Greek astronomer, uh, Hippocus, uh, during the 2nd century, century BC, have uh, been rediscovered uh, by researchers at the National Centre for Scientific Research in Sorbonne University in France and Tyndale House, uh, which is associated with the University of Cambridge. These texts were discovered using multispectral imaging methods after being wiped from a manuscript uh, during um, sometime in the medieval period anyway in order to reuse the pages. They needed paper, so they wiped whatever it was. Uh, Now, the study of these extracts, which has been published in the Journal for the History of Astronomy, uh, sheds new light on ancient astronomy and what they were thinking back then. Now, it's likely that Hippocus wrote this star chart sometime between 170 and 120 BC, which makes it the first document or documented effort to pinpoint the exact location of stars uh, or fixed stars associated with uh, numerical coordinates. Now, this text was previously only known through the works of Claudius uh, Ptolemy, another ancient astronomer who compiled his own catalogue around uh, 400 years later. The descriptions of four constellations from Hippocus star catalogue have recently been deciphered by researchers uh, from the Leon Robin Centre for Research of Ancient Thought and their British catalogue uh, uh, from the Tynesdale House in Cambridge. This discovery comes from the Codex Climaci Rescriptus, a book made up of parchments that were erased and then rewritten. And in the past, this codex contained an astronomic, uh, astronomical poem in ancient Greek with, uh, among elements of commentary on the poem, fragments of Hippicus catalogue. And it was, as I said before, erased in medieval times. It's uh, been revealed through multispectral imaging by a team from the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library, the Lazarus Project, aptly named, and the Rochester Institute of Technology. And the fragments of the Star Catalogue are probably the oldest known to date and bring major advances in reconstruction. Firstly, they refute a widespread idea that Claudius Ptolemy's star catalogue is merely a copy of Hippocus, as the observations of the four constellations are different. Uh, On top of that, Hippocus data is verified uh, to the nearest degree, which would make his catalogue much more accurate than Ptolemy's, even though it was composed several centuries earlier. That's fascinating. For the research team, uh, this major discovery sheds new light on the history of astronomy in antiquity and on the beginnings of the history of science. And above all, it shows the power of advanced techniques such as multispectral imaging, uh, whose application on illegible um, papers could save numerous lost texts on philosophy, medicine or horticulture from absolute oblivion, which is very good news. I wonder what else they're going to find. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Now, we talked about SpaceX earlier in not too positive a light with uh, the amount of uh, material going into their um, uh, constellations around Earth. So let's put the negative press aside for a moment. Uh, SpaceX 
Uh, looks like it's about to launch Japan's startup ice spaces first moon lander, Hakuto R. Now, it was due to be launched last week, but unfortunately there has been a delay, uh, unspecified. But when it ultimately gets off the ground, the mission will be the third moon launch from US soil in less than four months, fingers crossed, after SpaceX's successful launch of the South Korean Pathfinder Luma, Lunar Orbiter in August and the debut of NASA's Space Launch System rocket last month. Uh, perhaps more importantly, iSpace has the opportunity to become the first company in history to, uh, to successfully land a privately developed spacecraft on the moon, a milestone that would arguably mark the start of a new era in lunar expl- uh, exploration. Uh, iSpace's first Hakuto R moon lander is expected to weigh approximately a ton at liftoff and is designed to land up to 30 kilograms of cargo on the lunar surface. Uh, the lander is made by several commercial partners. iSpace has provided most of the design and structure, but Europe's uh, Ariane Group supplied all of Hakuto R's engines, plumbing and propulsion hardware, and was responsible for most of the final assembly. Because of Ariane Group's involvement, it's likely that Hakuto R shares direct heritage with the European service module currently powering NASA's Orion spacecraft on its first mission to the moon. It also arguably makes the mission more of a collaboration between Europe and Japan than an exclusively Japanese mission, though uh, Hakuto R will still technically Japan's first private mission to the moon. Where do stars go when they die? Uh, I'm not talking about the Hollywood Walk of Fame, although you don't have to be dead to be on that. But uh, stars do eventually die and they need a final resting place. And researchers at the University of Sydney have been trying to find out where that place is. They've been searching for the remains of stars, ancient stars, uh, that have collapsed into black holes or turned into neutron stars or whatever. Well, they seem to have found the graveyard. Uh, They have successfully charted this for the first time. It was a stellar graveyard far exceeding the height of our own galaxy. Uh, They've published their findings in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. The researchers aptly call their discovery a galactic underworld. Now, the height of the galactic underworld is over three times larger than the Milky Way itself. And according to the lead author, Dave Sweeney, a Sydney Institute for Astronomy PhD student, an amazing 30% of objects have been completely ejected from the galaxy and they show a fundamentally different different distribution structure to the visible galaxy. So uh, if you want to uh, find out more about the, the graveyard of stars that seems to surround our own galaxy, it's in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society. And if you've ever been to Epcot at uh, Disney Complex in Florida, you'll know it has a really good astronomical section, although they didn't have this when I was there. The Centauri Space Station. Now, this sounds amazing. You can sit there with the kids and have uh, a really interesting meal while looking at an astronaut's eye view of Earth rotating below. Uh, It's a cosmic experience and it is just fantastic. They even have zero-proof non-alcoholic cocktails for the kids and uh, every meal... Uh, enables the children to receive limited edition packs of trading cards that feature trivia facts and illustrations about space exploration, food in space, uh, and, of course, space innovation. So uh, I, I mention it because I, I've been to the place and I've, I've um, checked out uh, quite a bit of it, uh, and, yeah, I, I couldn't recommend it more highly as an educational facility, and it's good to see that they keep improving it and keep adding on uh, such amazing new bits and pieces um, in terms of technology. Uh, who knows where these kinds of places will be in future as far as entertainment and uh, sharing of knowledge is concerned. Now, if you want to chase up all of those stories, they're on astronomydaily.io. You can read all about it uh, or you can subscribe to the newsletter and get it to your inbox every day or you can wait for the next edition of Astronomy Daily coming out tomorrow. And don't forget to leave your reviews, please, if you don't mind, on your favourite podcasting platform. 
Uh, Hallie, we've got to go. Anything before we finish up? Yes. It's interesting that you happen to mention Epcot because today is officially Walt Disney Day, commemorating his birth on this day in 1901. No way. Way! Well, isn't that a curious coincidence? All right, thanks, Hallie. We'll see you soon. Bye. Until next time, this is Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. Astronomy Daily, the podcast. With your host, Andrew Dunkley.